What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with Gary Arnoldson was given on May 14th, 2013. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to today's devotional, where we will have the opportunity of hearing from Gary Arnoldson, controller for the McKay School of Education. We welcome his wife, Leslie, who is seated on the stand, as well as their family members and friends who have joined us today. Gary grew up in Moroni, Utah, and served nine years in the military. He earned his bachelor's degree in accounting from Utah State University and an MBA from the University of Phoenix. Brother Arnoldson began his career with Utah Power and Light, then switched to public accounting in Vernal, Utah for several years. He was then the controller for Snow College in Ephraim, Utah for 24 years, and now serves as the controller in BYU's McKay School of Education. Brother Arnoldson's favorite calling in the church has been that of Scoutmaster. Currently, he is serving as a stake president in Mount Pleasant, Utah. He and his wife, Leslie Shelley, are the parents of seven children and have 18 grandchildren. And now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Brother Arnoldson. It is a blessing and an honor to be asked to speak to you today. I never dreamed having such a great opportunity as this, and I pray the Spirit to be with both of us. I'm just a country kid from Moroni, Utah, so this is an extraordinary experience for me. As I prayed about what I should talk about, I had many topics come into my mind. It was hard to decide what would be the best for you as well as something I'm passionate about. The letter I received said that I should pick a topic that is important to me. One of my favorite candies is M&Ms. And one of my favorite interests is missionary work. So with that in mind, I started to think of the M&Ms of missionary-minded members. For that is what I'm involved in a lot as president of our stake. The first M&M that I wanted to address was miraculous conversion. When I hear that, I think of Alma, Ammon, Wilford Woodruff, Paul, and other great missionaries. And then I think that's way above me, and I turn it off. But this is the start of the sweetness of missionary desires. I came from a family in Moroni that wasn't active. I can't remember sitting in a sacrament meeting with my mom and dad. My dad would always pound on the furnace register to make sure I got up for church. But there were long stretches when I can't remember going to church. My dad was a school teacher, so we, in the summers, would take and go fishing and hiking and camping and anything else but just not church. One time after being gone all summer, I went to church and Veldon Blackburn, a friend of mine, asked why I'd gone inactive. I told him I wasn't inactive, I just didn't come to church. <laughs> During the summer a few years later, I worked hard to be the best and get the best job in Moroni, which was working on the vaccination crew for the Moroni Feed Company. I worked really hard and made the crew we could go through a flock of 10,000 turkeys in an hour and not lose one. Anyway, we were vaccinating some turkeys up by Fountain Green, and they were just a little bigger than usual. So we were taking them out of the brooder coop, vaccinating them, and then putting them into a truck and taking them out to the growing pens. We had finished about half the flock when I grabbed a turkey, gave it a shot, and threw it up in the truck. As I grabbed another turkey, the last turkey decided it didn't want to be in the truck. So it came out and hit me in the back of my arm, and I gave myself the next shot. <clears throat> it was in, me, in my hand, in between the index finger and the thumb. I will never get foul cholera, erysipelas, or Newcastle. Or <clears throat> I grew a big abscess in the palm of my hand, about the size of a tennis ball. And so I went to the family doctor in Mount Pleasant, Dr. Speakman. After a few months of lancing and the abscess and getting the gunk out of it, 
The doctor said he would have to take my three fingers off to save my hand. I'm kind of attached to those three fingers, and it makes it much easier to play the guitar. I told Dr. Spinkman I wanted to speak to my dad. He worked just up the street in the school district office at that time. So Dr. Speakman left the room and, to contact him. As soon as he left, I started to pray, probably the first real sincere prayer of my life. Before the doctor came back with my dad, <clears throat> I knew what my dad was going to say and what he was going to do. I knew that I would not lose my fingers and or my hand. A calm had settled over me and a peace that I just knew I would be OK. That day, I made some promises to the Lord. One, I would live the word of wisdom to the best of my knowledge and ability. Two, I would serve him all of my life. I didn't realize people lived so long. <clears throat> but back then, that meant that I was to serve a mission. Both of these promises I have worked hard to keep. My dad took me out of the office and put me in the car. And we went straight to Provo to a specialist, Dr. Aaron. The hand took over a year to heal. In fact, the next summer, when I was in basic training, I remember leaving blood on the rocks of the, <clears throat> of the field where we did push-ups. I had a simple prayer answered, and I knew it. <clears throat> and the important thing is I knew that the Lord knew me. I can't even explain the peace and the comfort that came over me in the doctor's office that day. It took a few years even to understand what really happened in the, that day in the doctor's office. But his, it has made all of the difference in my life. And being a 17-year-old kid in a small town hanging around the friends I had, the word of wisdom was a big challenge. And no one in my family had ever gone on a mission. It was not expected of us. So when I announced I wanted to serve a mission, it surprised many. It may have even shaken a few testimonies. I had another hurdle to overcome, though, because in those days, the government would only let two missionaries out of a ward at any one time. And I had a lot of friends whose parents were active that would fill up those quotas. So I joined the Army National Guard so that I would not have to take one of those quotas for missionaries. My mir miraculous conversion was nothing more than an answer to a simple but very sincere prayer. I interview many young people for missions these days, and I ask them if they have asked in prayer about what the Lord would want them to do about going on a mission. I'm surprised how many don't ask. Most are just going along with the next step in their life, just trying to make the best decisions they can. It is important to know what the Lord wants of you. A couple of years ago, in the Mount Pleasant North Stake, we could not get a young man to go on a mission. We only had nine missionaries out from our stake, and that's not very many. So we prayed about it and really made a push, and seven young ladies stepped up and sent their missionary applications in. And at that point, we had as many young ladies as young men on missions. I just released the first two of those young ladies this last week, and what powerful missionaries they have become. But what really is exciting and neat is the great mothers they will become, and, <clears throat> and that is for the next generation of missionaries. The sweetness of this M&M is so important that I want to tell you about my last son, Kyle. He's a great kid. When he was 16, he started to <clears throat> be a cowboy and started to ride bulls. And there's only one thing stupider than a bull. When the <clears throat> Kyle turned 19, I filled out his mission papers, and those papers sat. Some of his friends got things together and left on their missions, but not Kyle. <clears throat> I think we filled out two or three sets of papers for him. And then when he was coming up on 21, I threw out all his papers. Then later that year, he came to me asking where his pa mission papers were, and I hit the fan. I told him that I was sick and tired of his hypocrisy, and I didn't want him to go on a mission. In fact, I didn't care if he ever went on a mission. Then it flashed before me that I might be going to heck if I don't treat my son a little better. <laughs> and <clears throat> I might be preventing him from going on a mission and bringing salvation to his soul. So I asked him if he had been praying about a mission. 
He told me that he had been putting a lot of thought into it and had some feelings about going. That wasn't good enough. I had heard that same old story before. So I told him he had to find out what the Lord wanted him to do. I was very heated through this conversation, and it would have been very easy for Kyle to say, well, so much for that. But he didn't. He had been feeling something, and I think the Spirit had already touched his life. He did go on a mission, and now he is married with, <clears throat> to a great young lady with the second boy on the way. It is not a big thing. It is a small whisper. Miraculous is anything coming from the Lord, for he is the giver of all good gifts. As it says in the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenant, verse 7, Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. The second m and is a marvelous work and a wonder. As stated in the 29th chapter of Isaiah, verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. In the fifth chapter of Jacob in the Book of Mormon, we read the allegory of the olive tree. In verse 6, it says, after many days. In verse 15, it says, a long time passed away. And then again in verse 29, it says, again, a long time passed away. But in the last few verses of this long chapter, we read about the Lord of the vineyard doing what he had done before, except this time he worked alongside the servants. He does not leave the vineyard or the servants again. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard sent his servant, and the servant went and did as the Lord had commanded him, and brought other servants, and they were few. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto them, Go to, and labor in the vineyard with your might. For behold, this is the last time that I shall nourish my vineyard, for the end is nigh at hand, and the season speedily cometh. And if ye labor with your might, with me ye shall have joy in the fruit which I shall lay up unto myself against the time which will soon come. And it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their mites, and the Lord of the vineyard labored with, also with them, and they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard all in all things. Just think, who is in charge of this work, and what has happened in just a few short years since the restoration? The church is covering the whole earth, we are still but few, but look at the marvelous work and a wonder that has happened. Section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants starts out, Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. That is true today, more so than ever before. We are witnessing that coming to pass. We are not only witnesses to it happening, but we are participants in it. Doctrine and Covenants, Section 88, <clears throat> states, Behold, and lo, I will take care of your flocks, and will raise up elders and send unto them. Behold, I will hasten my work in its time. Is it time? Every one of you will remember where you were when you heard the <clears throat> President Thomas S. Monson's timeless declaration, lowering the age of missionaries. I even remember where I was and the date when it was announced that all worthy males would be able to hold the priesthood. I was west of Hanksville, just before you get to Hanks Canesville. It was June 10th, 1978. That was a pivotal point in the church. But this announcement is also far-reaching and will prove to be eternal in its consequences. The great part of being 17 was that I knew everything. I was, not, I was on top of my world. But I soon found out that there was something greater than myself, and I wanted to keep the promises I had made. The 58th section of the Doctrine and Covenants reads, Verily I say, men, are, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause, and do many things of their own free will, and bring to pass much righteousness. For the power is in them, wherein they are agents unto themselves. And inasmuch as men do good, they shall in no wise lose the reward. So this marvelous work and a wonder took a new meaning for me. It became my greater cause. In section 8, 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 22, it reads, Brethren, shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward and not backwards. Courage, brethren, and on, on to the victory. Let your hearts rejoice and be excitingly glad. Let the earth break forth in singing. Let the dead speak forth anthems of eternal praise to the King Emmanuel. 
who hath ordained before the world was that which would enable us to redeem them out of their prison, for the prisoners shall go free. The most important part of the marvelous work in a wonder is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. This here is a 1914 edition of the Book of Mormon. It was only given to me a couple years ago by the daughter of Leland Erastus Anderson. The miracle of this book is that the inside cover of the book shows that it was given to my grandfather by his uncle, Hiram Smith Arnoldson, which gave me a tie to know the power of the Book of Mormon in missionary work. You see, there are two branches of the same family represented here, an active and faithful branch and a wayward branch, and there is nothing more powerful than the Book of Mormon and the covenants of the temple to bring a family together again. The talk on the Book of Mormon is a whole different talk, but the importance of it cannot go unnoticed when it comes to a marvelous work and a wonder. President Ezra Taft Benson stated, the time is long overdue for a massive flooding of the earth with the Book of Mormon for the many reasons which the Lord has given. In this age of electronic media and mass distribution of the printed word, God will hold us accountable if we do not now move the Book of Mormon in a mar monumental way. We have the Book of Mormon, we have the members, we have the missionaries, we have the resources, and the world has the need. The time is now. I have a vision of homes alerted, of classes alive, and of pulpits aflame with the spirit of the Book of Mormon message. I have a vision of home teachers and visiting teachers, ward and branch officers, and stake and mission leaders counseling our people out of the most correct of any book on earth, the Book of Mormon. I have a vision of artists putting into film, drama, literature, music, and painting the great themes and great characters from the Book of Mormon. I have a vision of thousands of missionaries going into the mission field with hundreds of passages memorized from the Book of Mormon so that they might feed the needs of a spiritually famished world. I have a vision of the whole church getting nearer to God by abiding by the precepts of the Book of Mormon. Indeed, I have a vision of, the, of flooding the earth with the Book of Mormon. I do not know fully why God has preserved my life to this age, but I do know this, that the present hour he has revealed to me the absolute need for us to move the Book of Mormon forward now in a marvelous manner. You must help with this burden and with this blessing which he has placed upon the whole church, even all the children of Zion. Moses never entered the promised land. Joseph Smith never saw Zion redeemed. Some of us may not live long enough to see the day when the Book of Mormon floods the earth and when the Lord lifts his con condemnation. But God willing, I intend to spe spend all my remaining days in that glorious effort. The third m, &M is for magnify. From verse 4 of section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we read, For behold, the field is white, all ready to harvest. And lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perisheth not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. The gospel is as true today as it was in 1829 when this section of the Doctrine and Covenants was given. A mission is not a saving ordinance, but it does bring salvation to the soul. I have been home from my mission for 41 years now, and there has not been a day go by that I haven't been blessed by my mission. The mission only lasted two years, but 40 years later, it has not dimmed by time. If it only brought, save one soul into salvation, mine, it was worth it. Section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants shares some of the insights as to what we can expect as the blessings from the Lord start to flow into our lives. For whoso is faithful unto obtaining these two priesthoods of which I have spoken, and the magnifying their calling, are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. They become the sons of Moses, and of Aaron, and the seed of Abraham, and the church and kingdom, and the elect of God. And also, all they who receive this priesthood receive me, saith the Lord. For he that receiveth my servants receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receive my father. And he that receiveth my father receiveth my father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my father hath shall be given unto them. All the father hath, what is more? 
There is no more. Again, from the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants in verse 2, we read, Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand blameless before God at the last day. If you serve God with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, you can stand before God blameless at the last day. Let me submit to you that the last day can be the last day of your mission or the last day of any calling you might receive. That great and last day is going to be glorious if you have other last days of every calling you have where you serve the Lord with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. I remember coming home from my mission and thinking, I have served with all of my heart, might, mind, and strength. Now, I wasn't the shiniest candy in the bowl during my mission, but I did the best I could, and I have tried to do that same thing with every calling I have received since. The final M&M is for money management. It is not the most critical factor in determining a mission, but it can define and definitely be mind-consuming. Any young person who comes up with the desire to serve a mission can definitely find funding. But don't take it for granted. I think the Lord expects us to do all we can to prepare financially and not leave it up to someone else. When I started working for Snow College in 1983, we had taken a big cut in pay to move home. We about starved that first year, but we came up with a plan for saving up for our kids' missions. Our first two children were girls, and then the next five were boys. We always planned on the boys going on missions, so we saved a little bit each month for their missions. And we also had a plan to have our home paid off by the time missions start to come. When my second daughter said she would like to serve a mission, it was at the same time my oldest son was getting ready for his mission. They both received their mission calls the same day. My daughter enter, entered this MTC two weeks before my son, and they were in the MTC at the same time. Dana was going to Mexico City, and Philip was going to Kiev, Ukraine. We had the money for Philip, but we didn't have a dime for Dana. <clears throat> <clears throat> from the week before Dana entered the MTC to her last week in the mission field, we did not pay a full mission payment for her. It was amazing. People would come up to us and say, you need this more than I do. And even a couple of businesses in Mount Pleasant paid a full mission payment four or five times. Even my parents stepped up. Dana's mission was completely paid for this way. When Dana got home, I thought we were going to get rich off these missions, but not one more dime ever came in. But what a blessing those donations were. I can't help Phil. It was because we had planned and saved for many years, and the Lord did the rest of what we couldn't do. Missionary work is exciting for what it is. It is hard. It is scary. It is consuming, it is exciting, it is fulfilling, and many other words. However, just like the candy M&Ms that come in so many colors, but all taste the same. Missionary work looks different for every person, but all leads to the same thing, bringing souls unto Christ. You can come up with your own M&Ms, and I'm sure that there are a lot more M words out there that can represent missionary-minded members. It still all comes down to the work of the Savior. Miraculous conversion, just a simple prayer. Marvelous work, the Book of Mormon, such a great cause. Magnify all the Father has, and money management, knowing whose work this really is. I know God lives. This is his great plan of happiness that the world needs. I know that God the Father and his son Jesus Christ appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith. The fruits are before you. I know that President Monson is the prophet today, and this is the Savior's kingdom upon the earth with an eternal mission to accomplish. Now that I am getting closer to going on a mission again, I find that my wife and I are challenged with the same issues and the same concerns about a mission that I had when I was 17 years old. But now I know. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
This BYU devotional address with Gary Arnoldson was given on May 14th, 2013.